Evening, everyone, and welcome to Henry Moore Institute's uh, research fabrication season. My name is Elizabeth Nielsen, and I'm the co-director of Pangaea Sculpture Centre, and uh, we have developed this season of talks in collaboration with the Henry Moore Institute. Um, tonight, we are joined by Thomas J. Price. Um, we'll be discussing his work and fabrication and relationship to fabrication, sorry. And I'm also joined by uh, Dr. Claire O'Dowd from the Henry Moore Institute. I wanted to just say a little bit about who Pangaea Sculptors Centre are, because some of you might not be familiar with us. Uh, we're a platform for supporting contemporary sculptors, uh, started by an artist in 2013. We foster excellence in fabrication and facilitate the production of innovative new sculpture. We offer fabrication, technical and commissioning services and develop critical cultural and educational program programming around contemporary sculpture. Um, we support practitioners and we promote and enrich the wider public's engagement with this art form. So this series of uh, events has been developed, as I said, with the Henry Moore Institute. And over the next few months, we have several events that are aimed at demystifying um, some of the practicalities of how sculpture is made. This talk, along with the others, seeks to acknowledge and explore the relationship between artists and skilled fabricators and the processes of exchange and collaboration. Uh, we hope to explore the blurred lines between art, craft and industry and examine the ways in which making sculpture has changed. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Clara Dow to say a little bit here and we'll come back to you. Thank you very much, Lizzie. It's really brilliant to have been able to develop this season of talks with Pangea Sculpture Centre. Um, fabrication is such a, a huge part of sculptural production, but it's often not talked about and it's kind of one of the best kept secrets of the art world, really. So the relationship between artists and fabricators, different approaches to the subject, it often gets overlooked in discussions about sculpture. And we as audiences tend only to see the finished product and not necessarily have much of an idea of how it got there. So we want to give fabrication um, a moment in the spotlight um, to share some insights with our speakers um, into this kind of hidden part of sculpture uh, and how different artists and different fabricators navigate those relationships. So it's brilliant to have Thomas J. Price here this evening. Um, before we get stuck into our conversation, we have um, some general housekeeping. So the event's being recorded tonight and it's going to be available on the Henry Moore Institute's YouTube channel, um, as well as on um, the Henry Moore Institute website and Pangea Sculpture Centre's website. If you need subtitles, um, you can turn them on or off by clicking the CC button um, on your toolbar, which controls the live transcript. Um, if at any point you freeze or you lose connection, we recommend restarting Zoom and using the same link to join the webinar again afterwards. You can submit questions as we're going through the conversation using the chat function in the bottom of your toolbar. Um, we would love to have your questions and we will put them to Thomas as we're going through our discussion. Um, if you want just to mention your name, please include it in the message, otherwise we'll keep the questions anonymous. So I'm going to hand back to Lizzie to introduce Thomas and to kick off this evening's discussion. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, so just to say a little bit about how this evening is going to be structured as well. So Claire and I are going to be in conversation with Thomas. It's uh, hopefully going to be dynamic. We don't want it to be too um, stilted. Hopefully I'll be able to not look at my notes and we'll be able to chat and include your comments along the way. So please do add them into the chat function and if we can, we will chuck them in um, as we're going. So finally, my pleasure to introduce Thomas J. Price. You can see him along. So Thomas J. Price is a London-based um, multidisciplinary artist. He works across sculpture, film, photography and performance and he explores representation in its many, many forms. Since 2005, his work has focused predominantly on figurative sculptures, and those figurative sculptures are predominantly of black men. Um, he's been exhibited widely across the UK and North America and Canada, and has forthcoming installations, has a big forthcoming installation in London, which will be his first publicly funded outdoor sculpture 
commemorating the Windrush Generation with Hackney Council. Um, so tonight, I hope that we will discuss his career and relationship to making and attempt to get some juicy tips and tidbits along the way, through anecdotes maybe. I'm hoping that he's going to walk us through some re recent examples of his work with fabricators, including the different processes, working with foundries, and perhaps we'll talk more in depth about um, one or two of those large, large scale sculptures he's been working on. Um, I really hope that this will be a conversation about Thomas's practice and how it's evolved and how working with fabricators has advanced that evolution. Um, I think we'll probably get to cover some of the critical discussion around the essential conversations that have been going on around racism and race inequality in which Thomas has been really part of, a vocal part of um, uh, advocating for. Um, his work talks about not just making and exhibiting his work, but also advocating and being vocal for public art that doesn't celebrate specific individuals, but brings collective moments and imagination together. So I'm gonna share my screen, if I can, so we can look at some images and we'll talk through some of these things. So first, Thomas, um, it's great to have you with us. Thank you very, very much. I'd love to hear more about your journey into art making and if it was always obvious to you that you would be making large outdoor sculptures. Uh, thank you for having me, Lizzie. Um, that's a big question to start with. Um, <laughs> I actually, I, I began my art making with very small um, objects. I, I, I don't think I even thought about them as sculptures at the beginning. Um, this is, even as a child, you know, I would be making things with my hands. I would be trying to recreate the things around me um, out of pipe cleaners and um, the kind of material I had to hand. Um, and I, I think I was always, or I always, always had an affinity with the small scale, or I found there was a power in, in small scale, the way that it immediately sort of brought to mind large scale. So it, it kind of created this awareness of, of scale and one's relative scale to an object. And I think that throughout my career sort of attached itself to understandings of status, as in status of individual status within society, status of particular people, um, which tied into sort of my increasing awareness of my identity or my perceived identity as I was growing up. So we're talking, you know, school, but then art school and, and subsequently, um, and how society and people who look like myself are categorized in a particular way. And then that drew me into history of, of racial equality and, and you know, all sorts of sort of, um, social sciences. Um, but I think before any of that, there was a real, um, I think, a, almost a, a desire to, to connect with the inner self and connect with identity in terms of one's feelings and, and, and see how that can connect to other people or how that compares to other people. Yeah. And I think that's been the, the thread that has connected everything I've done is this trying to, yeah, trying to kind of sew together using this thread of uh, interpersonal connections or lack mm -hmm. of interpersonal connections and, and explore the desire for those uh, and and how they can be successful and how they can how they can fail. So I think I've managed to not talk about uh, doing large sculptures here, but you know, it was. Um, I mean, we're looking on the screen now at a, a performance piece I did many many years ago, or two thousand and one. There we go. Um, <laughs> I'm still healing. Yeah, I, was, I was hoping you might be able to tell us a bit about this development of sculpture, maybe how you actually. Yeah. Sculpture. Well, I, you know, I've, I've just described how I, I loved making things as a child. You know, who doesn't? But I think for me, there was, there was this huge conceptual element of wonder and of querying the world around me. And try, as I say, this is, this is, and, and trying to connect to other people, trying to understand interpersonal connections and understand how they're supposed to function, understand why we have certain emotions, why we feel certain things. That, does someone else feel the same, you know? Can you recreate a sensation of feeling in someone else by showing them um, a series of frequencies, light frequencies and sound frequencies in order to try and replicate uh, the, the experiential element of a memory? And this piece we're looking at here called Licked was a performance piece which resulted in installation. That was sort of how I labeled it um, back in my student days. 
And this is a, a, a small gallery space, um, actually in the old Chelsea College of Art on Marissa Road. And um, over the period of three days, I licked the interior of this space. And the idea initially was to, to layer it with a, an invisible layer of my saliva, which would, and, I, and, the, and the question for me was, would this be able to communicate to a visitor who, who came to the room later on, a sense of someone else being there? Would they be able to pick up on the, uh, you know, if I have a chemical kind of traces, would they be able to pick up on, on me, on my identity, or, or feel a proximity to someone? And there was another element, which was the performative aspect. And would this, would the, the, would the word of this performance go around and would people believe it? So that was uh, um, these sort of, uh, these layered sort of intentions. But what happened very quickly was that, well, I, I initially thought that the ball was, was dirty. Um, when I first put my tongue against the wall, it just stuck, you know. So I had to rethink the plan, get a, a bottle of water and a, and a flannel and some chewing gum. And I'd douse the flannel in water and try and wet the wall on my tongue, keep chewing the gum. And I'd go through with my hands, licking section of the wall. Because once you get close to the wall, you realise how big even quite a small wall can be. Uh, when you're licking it, well, as you do, um, it really, it's a very, very physical act at the beginning and it's it's just as bad at the end and this, so this dirt I thought was on the wall was in fact um, my tongue starting to bleed and it became uh, worse and worse or you know the, the blood flow became more and more and so you can see here you know that's towards the end of the piece and it was literally like just painting with a red paintbrush using my tongue um, so it became this very visible history this of of you know, human endeavor to try and connect um, to an imagined audience, you know, to a generalized audience. Um, and I think for me, this was, you know, I've said before, this was a kind of a turning point for me in how I, well, first of all, understanding the things that I wanted to try and do in the practice, which weren't going to follow this very, very sort of um, sensationalized um, path. It was much more about being reflective and and trying to encourage a reflective um mindset from the viewer i mean this was this was don't get me wrong this this connected to people but it was for me it was it was useful as a, a marker of intention thomas you mentioned that you you were a student when you made this piece um can you tell us a bit more about your experiences at art school because you went, you went to the Royal mm. College of Art, and I did. Yeah, um, you it's had, you, yeah. So you have, you were lucky enough to have access to a foundry there, and you made yeah. that performance piece there. So, what what kind of processes did you learn there, and what what did you come out of art school with? It's interesting because I almost immediately, as soon as I left art school, I realised all the resources I had to hand. And perhaps all the resources I took for granted and didn't utilize to their full extent. So yeah. I had, you know, even from BA, so at Chelsea, then to the Royal College, I had, you know, workshops, the you know, wood workshop, metal working shop. At, uh, at both, I had foundries. You know, the Royal College foundry was, was fantastic. Um, and I was very aware that when I was at college, the you know, people in the roles of technicians, who are usually artists in their own right, were the people that I, often gravitated towards and and sort of pro probably learned the most from to, to a greater degree because if, if, if you are you know about making about interacting with material um it's good to talk to other people who have been there and done that and can tell you about it and so i think i always had a you know from the beginning i had quite a high regard for the technicians and, and then the tutors would give you more of a you know, conceptual feedback. But so the experience was for me, just an overly positive one in terms of being able to make uh, and having, having some space, you know, there's never enough space, but it's, it's only when you get your first studio space after college, you're like, Oh God, damn, that was good. You know? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, access to access to peers, access to people you can talk to every day. You can, you know, again, like when I first got my studio outside of college, it was like, right, I need to move this thing. <laughs> oh, you, you've got no one to help you necessarily. You know, you have to hire people in, you know, it's like everything becomes a lot more complex or complicated. 
Um, so I think that having people to, to explore ideas with verbally, to see other people making their work, to have access to almost you know, immediate access to workshops, to experiment, to be guided through safely making, you know, like, okay, you couldn't use the, the circular saws and stuff, but there was many other things that you could experiment with. And, you know, I, I learned much about mold making, um, to a lesser degree modeling, because no one really was doing that at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of, you know, welding and, also, and, and, and foundry elements. So how to chase bronze, how, you know, it's the things to think about further down the stage when you're making your initial model. So that, that was, that's all there to be gleaned if you want it, but equally, if you're not interested in that, then it's, it's not there. Like, or you, if you're not looking for it, it might have been, or it might have appeared to, to not have been there. So I think if you engage it with kind of a level of inquisitiveness, which, or demand, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, then, then the information is there or the, the, the facilities are there, resources are there. Um, but that was some time ago. You mentioned a bit about um, that you were modeling at that point. And I think you were also making films. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. so I mean, we look on the screen at the the um, the first actual physical sculpture I, I, I showed. This is the Royal College, um, and uh, initially though I was making stop motion animations. Um, so again, it was about scale. So I was making these tiny little models, which were very rudimentarily made out of plasticine with um, wooden beads, painted wooden beads for eyes, and it was about the kind of the expansion and and, and condensing of time. So via the process of analyzing movement and eye movements and internal thoughts and trying to translate that through the eye movements, um, I was able to go frame by frame, second by second, through a three minute period of someone sort of having a thought about, you know, thinking about something. And, and then through the process of playing that back at 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second, if you want to punish yourself, um, you're able to then condense this time again. And, and, and at the same time as doing that, it's also about scale. So these very small things, which would pick up fingerprints and, and physical uh, record of interaction by the you know, by my hands, would then be um, projected as very large projections. You know, minimum about two by three meters. And you would walk into this black room, and this this face would emerge from blackness, and would just look past you and blink and move, and it would sort of draw you in. So initially, you think this is kind of like yeah, it's, it's a model. You know, it's a roughly made model. And then the movement starts to bring you into or draw you into their, that psychological space and it becomes a person. And then you notice that, you know, that actually it's, oh, that, a, a finger box just appeared and disappeared as a model. So it, it keeps you in this loop of recognition and this loop of um, awareness of, of the objectness, object nature of that thing and your process in creating um, a consciousness for it. So were these, can you tell us a bit about this sculpture then and its relationship? So, yes, yeah, so this is quite, again, this is another pivotal piece in as much as this came from a, a conversation, a tutorial I had with um, Denise Dakova, who's a fantastic artist and was a tutor at the Royal College. And she questioned why I was, I was making all these different um, experiments and physiognomies. So these different facial types to try and gauge reactions to different, inverted commas, types of people. And because uh, all these, these faces I was making were composites. So they were kind of fictional um, based uh, around kind of a, a psychological framework. So based around, um, loosely based around understandings of how people can react to certain facial traits um, and how we can sort of, we can decide subconsciously, unconsciously, the characteristics of an individual based on what they look like. And so I would go through and, and reconfigure often the same kind of person to experiment, literally experiment with the reactions. And, but I would never thought about showing them because these were tests for me for the animations. And it was put to me like, well, why wouldn't I show these? And I was very certain at the time, I was like, well, of course I wouldn't show these. These are, these are just tests. And it was only when you know, Denise left and I was kind of, I, I was left then with the, 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 the question in my head. Why wouldn't I show these? And and it, it when I did show this work, it was initially in a different 
format. I showed it on a sort of um, an open frame, almost like a mantelpiece, because I was playing with this idea of domestic scale. Mm -hmm. And this almost like this sort of guerrilla art of someone buying this piece of this fictionalized person who who was playing against the materials of monumentalism. So it's, it's um, plaster or acrylic composite mixed with marble dust on a scrap bit of wood on a scrap um, MDF shelf. And it's literally stuck to the wall with one screw. So everything is looking to undermine the uh, ex expectations of how we represent um, people that we want to look up to. Because, and also the height of this, this shelf was actually pretty low down. So you, you look down it or you have to get down to this level of the sculpture to see it properly. And, and it was, so this is my first sort of coming to awareness of dealing with notions of real, you know, of, of status as presented in sculpture, as in canon of sculpture, so an institution, and which got me looking at the works of, you know, we see around us, like, you know, on plinths in Whitehall, in, you know, yeah. in town squares, who do we see represented? They're, they're normally, you know, white men or horses or, you know, triumphant and of greatness. And so I wanted to totally critique portraiture in its entirety by making fictionalized characters. So it's not about individual greatness. And then initially by scale to, to, to make people aware of the huge scale of these, these things normally are at. Yeah, and that's... Um... Let's look at some of these as well, which scale even yeah. even more kind of evident in. Um, tell us a bit about these and are these like how close do these get to being your first kind of experience of working collaboratively with, fab with fabricators? Like, is this these bronze? So that yeah, so these are the, the the figure itself is bronze and it's on a car spray painted uh, perspex base onto a, a, a translucent acrylic. Uh, top, which is then onto a um, modified antique plinth. And the idea being that this kind of fictionalized amalgam contemporary character, um, it, but in a very traditional material, stands atop this, um, almost like this car plinth, you know, this kind of idea of cars as status. And so creating these bases out of car spray painted uh, uh, perspex. And then you can almost like, transition through into this antique, this literal antique, um, through the, the uh, translucent uh, layer of acrylic. Um, and so, yeah, this was my first, this is my first time? This is actually, no, so I, before this, I made a series of nude figures and that was my first um, working with a foundry. And I literally, had, for those ones, I was sculpting, I think like 30 plus hours in a row to make five of them for an art fair in, in, in Chicago, which, almost, <laughs> which was tough. Yeah, I would never do that again. Um, like uh, every every day I was doing one um, and then I'd go to the foundry and then I'd do the chasing and then the, a lot of the metal work um, and and it was really that was my first understanding of a commercial foundry uh, but it was it's not how you would want to do it like you, normally I go in and I check the waxes or if you know okay it's a, a pandemic at the moment which made it a bit tricky but I do the wax check and then go and check the metal but this one I was really having to do a lot of the work to try and keep the price down. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the main thing. It wasn't because I didn't trust them. It's because I couldn't afford them. <laughs> you know? um, and then when it came to these, uh, this, this, this series from Angel Town series, um, I think there, there was much more of the foundry. And I would, I would go in as you know, uh, an artist with, with a bit more funding and I was able to um, oversee more, and, but still, still hands on. Um, to different degrees and also with the, the plinths you know I didn't even have a router at that time so I'd, I'd have to get some uh, a wood maker to um, put the tops on for me but then I would go into their workshop and probably annoy them by saying oh that's not quite right and you know trying to gauge the the, the extent to which I could um, dictate essentially how this thing was going to be and, and, and maintain the, the vision of the object which is, which is definitely a learning experience in terms of getting comfortable with, um, yeah, making sure <laughs> things are right, uh, which is essential in my opinion. Can we talk a bit more about how you work with fabricators and that kind of 
collaboration versus control and and you know how how much input do you have into the process versus how much input did the fabricators have into this? Yeah, how, how does that work with with your practice now? Uh, I'm a control freak, so uh, I, <laughs> I, I, no, um, I, a lot comes down to trust. I was saying this earlier today. Actually, it's you. You have to trust. You know, so you have to do your homework on the, on the people that you're going to work with, and trust that they uh, have best intentions and trust in their skill. Um, but ultimately, it's it's yeah. It's it's about yeah how to work with people, um, how to work through people, how to achieve these things through the understandings and the skill sets and the immense experience that a lot of the artisans, technicians uh, you know, have. Um, and, and you can only really, I think you can only really do that fluidly once you have a bit of experience yourself or once you have some understanding of the process. Um, I think it, it can always be tricky. And there might be fabricators I've worked with watching this going, you know, no, he's a total so-and-so. But it, it, it takes some time to, to, to yeah, get the understanding, to, to be able to ask for the thing that you want. You, you, you know, if you're going to ask for something, you kind of need to know it exists. You know, that, it makes it a lot easier. So having done, you know, the modeling myself, having done previously some metal work, having, you know, having quite a strong vision of what I wanted, it made, I think it made it easier for me because I was working to quite a clear vision of what I wanted to achieve. And that would then align or not align with the, the, the kind of, the, you know, that gut feeling that you have, that instinct you have um, as any kind of creative person as to does this match what I need? Um, and I think I've worked with various different fabricators, different foundries, different you know, woodworkers, all sorts of people. Um, and and it's, a, it's definitely a two-way conversation because I think to ignore their, their understanding or to ignore their, their experience, it, 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 you know, they might then end up doing what you want, but that thing might lead to absolute you know, disaster. But, but you're the one paying and you've insisted, so they're going to do it. Um, but I, I, I've had actually really good experiences working with people. And I, I think these pieces, I can't remember who was cast. Um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've worked with a foundry that I was, I studied with the person who started it and um, I oh, still work with them. And because I, you know, it's about support and, and, and about at what point do you want to enter into that relationship with um, people who are making things? You know, do you want to get them when they've got the glitz and glamour around their name? Do you want to get them because they made so and so's? Does that make your work better, or do you look at, you know, their attitude towards making things? What what are their views on working with artists? You know, do they do they see it as just a a, a paycheck, or or do they love making things and, and want to help you realize the best things that you can? And and all of that becomes very apparent after working with someone for a little while. You know, and 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 there's no hiding from it. So. You really want people who who believe in what you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, who, who who love what they are doing, and and who want to help you realise, yeah, the best work, because that way, if you get that relationship right, they they they, you're able to utilise all that energy to raise the the standard that little bit more, and you can do that each time, you know, you're that that upward trajectory. Um, it's a self kind of, it feeds into itself. And, you know, I think most artists want to try and make the best work they can. That's probably why we keep making work because there's always a way you could have done it differently or a way you could do it better. And I think if you can find fabricators who also have the attitude, yeah. then you're onto a winning formula. It's interesting to hear you talk about that relationship and the kind of collaboration and the exchange that happens through that. But then when, and, and also you're talking about the reputation of fabricators, um, like within the field and who's, who are the big names and the, 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 the glamorous fabricators. But then when the work is shown, you know, we as, we as the viewing public, we don't see those names, we just see your name. So they're, they're kind of, um, they're kind of, um, 
I'm not sure the word, but they're, they're kind of um, hidden in the process. Um, and th there was an interesting um, discussion last week about this kind of myth of the artist um, as, as the person who who hand makes everything. So, like, <laughs> to, so do, do you feel like you're you're kind of part of this myth of, of the artist as a sole producer? I don't think I've ever posed in front of something um, pretending to have uh, made it, you know, a tool in hand at this finished item. <laughs> Rodan yeah. style. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I've tried to stay away from that sort of trope. I mean, like, don't get me wrong, I pose in front of my own work as I've been making it. Um, I, do I find, no, because for me, it's not really that important. Um, you know, I, I happen to have a hand in most stages of, of, what's made like mm -hmm. so you know which is why i now use a lot of digital sculpting because it allows me to maintain control throughout um mm -hmm. so there's not that interpretive element between if you have to work with a team of sculptures to enlarge something for example which i did for my first large sculpture um you know there was i, I didn't have a technical ability to get up on scaffold uh, and enlarge this thing um yeah there's network so that was yes you know, nine foot it was originally a three foot piece and I worked with two very, very skilled sculptors who were able to, to copy it. And, and I went in to kind of <laughs> ridiculously to try and talk them through getting the right um, expression. I can't remember how long I was there for, but that, I remember that was my first uh, experience of directing uh, people to try and sculpt in the way that I sculpt. And, and it's a, it's a real learning experience. You know, I, I've, I've been on the other end. I, I've, you know, in my younger days, I did some work in special effects and, I, and I, I've, I've listened to clients trying to describe what they want and I had to go and get it. Um, so it was interesting to, to, to have that switch and, and to be trying to take this very intimate experience, this intimate process of, you know, I would sculpt, I would make these things up as I went along and I would just know when it was right because it would have that right, it would register right and have that right feeling to me. So to try and describe that to someone you know, it, it doesn't work like that. So you have to, it really forces you to think through what you're doing as an artist and what your intentions are. So yeah. I think it's a really uh, enriching experience. I think it definitely helped me to um, get a much clearer understanding of what I'm, what I'm aiming for and, and to be able to quickly go through different, mentally go through different versions of what something could be and then how to articulate it to, to other people, which even when you're not, you know, trying to direct a sculpture, if I'm just trying to talk about work, well, I have a better understanding. So um, it normally helps. And if I'm trying to think of other types of work I can make, well, I'm able to identify what I was doing before. And I don't know, it just, it, it kind of enriches things. We've got a question just to clarify kind of the, the processes that went into some of these, sorry, these, yeah. these, these early ones. Were they um, cast from play? Yes, so this piece, uh, so it was started with um, an armature, um, uh, sort of a, what, what, what would you call that? An armature, you know, into the back, um, had aluminium uh, wire, which I would make a kind of a skeleton form out of. I'd use tin foil packed tightly onto it to create the, the form of the figure. Pretty much almost to um, completion, to be honest. I love working with tin foil. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very, for me, I find it very satisfying. I, I was just doing it this afternoon with, on another piece, actually. Um, and then I would put the clay over the top and then go in and with tools uh, and, and create the detail. Then I, I'm awful at making molds. I, like, I, I put my hands up to that. I just don't have the patience. Like by the time I've made the, the, the thing, I, I don't want to spend the same amount of time making a mold. It takes, you know, I work with some great mold makers and it, and it takes a different mindset and probably a lot more skill than I have <laughs> with that to, um, to, to do it well, because what you don't want to do is do all that work and then ruin it in a mold. And I, once you've locked a piece into a mold, you, you, you don't want to go back there. So um, these are then taken to the foundry as, as the clay models and molded. And then it's the lost wax process that I was using for these. Um, so it's um, a hollow layer of wax is put into the mold in, in a core of ceramic is put in, pins are put through, uh, the mold's taken off, ceramic shells put around it. Uh, well, I kind of skipped out a stage where you, you sprue it. So you put wax, um, 
runners and risers on, which allow. So once you basically once you've melted out the wax, which you put this whole mold into a furnace and you melt out the wax, um, you leave this void uh, where the bronze, the molten bronze, can be poured into, which will fill where the wax was. But you still have this ceramic core inside, which allows the piece to be hollow. So you don't have this huge lump of metal, which will also probably distort and crack under once it starts to cool. So, and then that's, um, that's then the, once that has solidified and cooled the, the bronze, uh, the shell is knocked off and cleaned up. And then you have the chasing or the metal working process where again, now I, I work with very skilled people who are you know, able to weld cleanly and quickly and, and follow the, the model that I've, I've made previously. And I, I go, I normally go in and, um, and, and check that it's all looking the way it's supposed to look. Um, a lot of, a lot of that part happens in the wax. Cause you go in and check the wax. You know, I, I often go in when I can put the detail in myself, you know, all by hand and, um, make sure it's, it's right. The way I think it's right. You know, um, as opposed to that slippage when it's what someone else thinks is right. And I guess that's where, you know, I made the joke about being a control freak. It's, it's more about maintaining the intentions and maintaining the vision of that work because ultimately that's the difference between a, uh, you know, a piece of artwork doing what the artist wants it to do and it becoming a sort of a, a mishmash of um, different intentions. So you know, I, 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 I take so it seriously when I go there. So with the, those ones it's kind of one to one and, and these ones it's, it's a massive scale shift. Yeah. Imagine that scale shift also is a a kind of price shift in terms of how much it's costing you and like mm. you know. so I guess there's a question of um how do you find when you know you want to do a project like this how do you how do you go from maybe things that are more modest to produce to something that is gonna you know gonna have an impact bank balance like are these produced with other people are they mm. are they um so this piece um I, I again I've made a smaller version of it and um, I won't go into the backstory of why that piece was produced, but I've been very, very lucky to have a core group of really uh, involved, supportive collectors who, who aren't like, they're not speculators. Um, they're people who actually, well, I think believe in, in the work and believe in the ideas that are being dealt with and perhaps to an extent would like to see me be able to achieve the things that I, I'm talking about. And so, you know, it's like it's basically incremental stages of of proof. You know, you okay, you have an idea, then you can talk about that idea, then you can show them on a smaller scale what you've done. So this piece was made large because a collector um, believed in the proposition of making it large and what that would do in terms of engaging with an audience and, and commenting on the subject matter of monumentality and, and identity and representation um, that I was trying to talk about. And through that collector, I won't mention them by name, but through that collector, they know who they are. Through that collector um, and the support of an institution, the, so this is at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, yeah. um, who again, you know, it was, it was through their, their willingness to to take a risk yes uh, risk on on a essentially an unknown artist um because they believed in the work and that was the thing that gave me the platform so the the collector with the financial ability to to purchase the work which funded it um opened up the opportunity to show in a in a, an institution which would be able to give a proper platform to these ideas and to, and to my practice and which, you know, so it's a financial kind of risk and it's, so it's basically a lot of people believing in what you do. And, and then, I think. Hmm. And then you've got to find the people that you believe in to make it with you. So how yes. do you find those people? And that's a question from um, on the audience as well. How do you identify the right place to go and make the work? And how do you start that conversation? With someone? So I think these days it's a lot, different or perhaps easier because the internet's around a lot more and you know instagram's around and 
you can you can visually see things access to visual uh, examples of what people have done is is there you can you can see the, the process of making a lot more now than you, you could back in the day i used to watch like you know on dvds i watched the how how it was made bits you know that's how, that's how i gleaned a lot of tips on how to actually model because i as i say i came from a performative background and video work and sound work and i wasn't I didn't have an intention of being, you know, I, I don't even consider myself now a figurative sculptor, but I had to be able to utilize the, the technical elements of that. So I had to learn how to do that because I couldn't afford anyone at the time. You know, mm. um, I, I would quite happily have got someone else to do it, but I sort of fell in love with it, doing it myself, learning it myself. So and get, get back to the point. Now I, I look at what's out there. Um, and, and I, I try and do my due, due diligence and, 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 do the research and um you know there's there's various people a lot of people float around and, do, and work in the different <laughs> they might work in different companies but it's, sometimes it's a small pool of people um but i do think there's a lot to be had from building relationships with fabricators so i i think i've worked with uh, one foundry for a long you know years and years and years you know and and i i think you know they've now grown hugely um and you know initially i think i was like the first jobs that they were doing these tiny little heads i was having cast and bronze yeah. and then some figures and now they're doing all sorts of amazing projects and it's so it's, it's, it's really you know encouraging and, and energizing to see your peers and the people you've grown up with also kind of taking on you know, more ambitious projects um some part, sometimes people get in contact with me you know like I, I get a lot of emails and and i and i tend to go through them and and you know, because you never know like um and sometimes it's based on what they have done previously in terms of if you're working with an institution say you know say if the budget is you know it's a big budget people need to know it's going to get delivered and it's going to get delivered to spec so to speak and it's going to get delivered on time and so even if i'm saying let's do it with this team i'm telling you they're brilliant blah blah, blah they go we want the people that work with and then insert large artist name you know and and that sometimes is inescapable and that's out of my my hands um but ultimately yeah you've got to work with the people that you that you vibe with you know it's like and that, again that's that's a bit of trust and a bit of a leap of faith sometimes to begin with and then it's about coming through you know from both sides coming through with what you've discussed and, and having that transparency and openness to really be honest about what you expect mm -hmm. Can we um, can we go back um, a little bit and talk some more about um, processes? This was this was going to be a question on our list, and it's also um, cropping up in the chat quite a bit. Um, and particularly um, when you're working at scale and you're working with um, fabricators to produce something uh, very large. Um, how do you work now with um, the digital? Because you've you've mentioned that um, the processes that you've 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 talked about so far have been really traditional processes, like talking about the foundry and lost wax casting and so on. But now you're you're working a lot more um, with the digital. Yeah. So can can you tell us a bit more about about that and how that's working yeah. in your practice now? I mean, I I, I love the traditional uh, processes. And I, I love the idea of technology, and I have represent, represented technology within my my sculptures using traditional processes. And so, for me, the kind of consideration or the yeah the consideration of using digital sculpting, for example, um, sort of matched that. You know, there's a congruence there in terms of what I was trying to look into, and then a way of exploring that subject matter. Um, and what I found is like with the, I guess I call it digital clay, you know, like this digital sculpting. I remember way back when I was at the Royal College and they had this haptic pen that would give you feedback. It was awful. It was, it was, awful. It was terrible. It's like, it's nowhere near that, that sense. I keep doing this. Um, there's nowhere near that sense of having substance or resistance in real life. Um, and I use software now where I just use a stylus. Um, and a kind of they call it 2.5D um, because it's it's two dimensional on your screen, but it can revolve and it and it looks you know, all, all intents and purposes to be three dimensional. But the brain does an amazing thing and it fills in 
<laughs> for what Liz Mine does. It fills in that sense. So I, I get this real sense of, of sculpting with material and using tools. Um, and what, that, what, what this process has done is allowed me to go from what I would describe as a linear sculpting process. So one where um, you, you sculpt it uh, in the real world and you have to make a decision and that decision leads you in a direction and then you make another decision and, you, and that leads you, you know, in a different direction. But you're, you're following this one singular line. And with the digital thing, you can, you can create your, your object and you can make a decision and you can go in this direction. You can save this decision as a file. And then you can also go, I'll go in this direction. And you can you know, go in multiple directions. And so you end up being able to explore much quicker and with less sort of um, preciousness, different options and different effects that things can do. And, the, the, and as someone who's trying to work through multiple um, facial expressions, for example, and the subtleties contained within facial types, it, it just matched instantly with what I was doing. It, it also allowed me to work with like the same character in a way where before I would, I would you know, make one person and make another person, make another person. And I was able to really look at nuance within the same physiognomy. Um, and then it had the other plus point of, I've made this thing just the way I want it. Now, how do I get that into the real world at any scale I want? Well, there would be now have machines. So instead of pointing machines where we would go and put a machine next to a smaller version and you know, try and move it around and, and transcribe the increased ratio to another object, you know, which was high technology in its time, we have 3D printers and we have CNC, uh, you know, routers, routers, we even call them, you know, that can carve out. Now, I say that there is caveat there. I, I, I believe that, you know, you can't, it's, this is no way for me, uh, uh, a, a process of pressing play and the thing is made. I only use certain elements within the 3D software. Like I purposely, well, I say purposely, I, I'm not that technically minded, but I, I, I only know how to access a certain portion of the software because I use it as a tool. I use it as a substitute for physical clay at that stage in the process. I don't want to know how to, to shortcut and do this and that, but I, I want to go through my, my, my sculpting process, the mentality I have if I was a sculpt, you know, like I was downstairs with tinfoil, I want to be able to use that same mentality within this software. When it comes to the CNC, you, you, I personally, like, I, I don't want to press play, like, okay, it's done. That, that's not done. That's now, it's helped me in a particular stage to transcribe information from one uh, source to another. And I, I've still got to go in and check that, redo it, or make other people get it to the point where it really, you know, where it works in real life. Um, and so I, I, I think, I, I, yeah, I think, you know, it goes back to the mentality or the intentions of the artist, um, because it's very easy to, to scan someone, very high res, have it CNC'd, you know, by computers, by machines, very high res. So you've got this, this 3D photo of someone perhaps, I don't know. But for me and what I do, that, that won't work. That's dead. That work is, you know, as my mother would say, it's got no soul, right? <laughs> um, you, you have to, I, there's a, at some, you know, depending on the artist and what they're doing and what the work is, I think it doesn't matter what the work is, to be honest, but that's at a different stage, the, something's put into that work, you know, there's, there's something special should be put into that work. And if you're totally hands off, and I think as I joked with you earlier, like if you're a poolside artist, you're like, you know, sipping your cocktail by the pool and someone else is going and doing all your stuff. You know, when, when, when is that magic being put in by the artist? And um, so what is, what, is what, what are you showing people? What, what part of yourself are you sharing with people? And, and I, and you know, when it goes back to licking that room, you know, if you want to connect with people when you want them to really experience what you're about sometimes you've got to put the effort in and you've got to really engage with the process and so i think even if someone is totally hands-off but they're engaged mentally and they're overseeing it that's that's i don't that's no problem you know but it, it's sorry i'm going off on you no know, i, I wonder because i'm this is actually a question that i've kind of i haven't ever asked you but i wonder so we're looking at a picture now of um Ahead, reaching out. You, you reaching out exactly, which is a, the um, one that's on the line. 
at the moment, which is a girl holding the mobile phone. Um, there's a, a question in the chat about if you could expand on the purpose of mobile phones in your work and, and why what they do to the posture and the figure and why you why do you include them? So I, I, I've had a thing about phones for a long time. Uh, I, I first included the phone in a piece of work during an animation in 2000s, maybe 2000, 2001, I'm not sure, maybe 2001. Um, and it was also what introduced the licking. It was actually a, a very narrative multi-scene piece where a guy was licking a mobile, uh, licking a, a, a handset. Um, so I just basically took both of those and made two separate bodies of work. Um, for me, it's about connection. It's, it's about the potential for connection. It's about the, the desire for connection. It's uh, about being, you know, because I isolate these figures in most, for the most part. They're, they're normally singular figures with no inclusion of back, background, uh, apart from the, the area they're in. Do they, do they belong to that place or not? You know, it's, it's, the ambiguity is there. But these phones are, a, are an acknowledgement of our, you know, our human nature, our, our, to the most part, our need to feel connected of our desire yeah, to, to communicate to you know, the same desire as an artist trying to communicate perhaps. Um, so it's about, you know, it's about being alone, but being connected. And, and nowadays it's about so much happens through mobile phones, you know, technology, it's a, it's a, it's a nod to technology. And as I described bronze as a technology, you know, the, um, the different alloys and, and why bronze is so successful it's because it's, it, it, you know, way back they, they discovered a mixture of metals which works phenomenally well in terms of tensile strength, resistance to corrosion, and able you know, malleability, etc. The way it can be worked, you know, it's a technology. And I love the fact that phones are a different type of technology. They can technology of communication, but they've become so much more. You know, we, you know, we're conditioned to, you know, I've got my phone right here. You know, we condition you know, that lights up and like, oh, you know, you get that endorphin, we're we're hooked. Yeah. Right? And, and, and so it's about what these phones can mean. So what they can mean to the individual and how they can be viewed from outside. And so, you know, the story I said, I wasn't going to tell about uh, network, the, the, the young man with a mobile phone, but well, that was initially a commission at a small size, um, at a smaller scale, which was rejected by the commissioning body because word came back to me that they were worried that this, this individual would look like a criminal because they were on their phone. And so it's about taking something which is, should be normal, should be fine, right? And, but, but basically making the, the viewer bring themselves to the work, which is why these are fictional characters and they're quite reserved in terms of what these, my figures do. This, you know, they're, they're, letting, they're creating a space where the viewer can bring themselves to the work. So the viewer, when, they, you know, when I'm saying they're figuring out who this person is, that the viewer is really bringing them they're, they're figuring out who they are in a sense you know. yeah. uh, their attitudes their learned attitudes you know our schemas in terms of you know how we reference things um and as you know i, I remember during the 2012 riots when blackberries were the thing in the media that would cause the riots you know <laughs> that, this blackberry messenger it's, it's terrible it's like you know i was going around with a blackberry on a, and on, on my on a bike, you know, checking that my brothers are okay when they when they, everything was kicking off, and it's that different reading of the same object. So if I place that object in a businessman's hands, you know, businessman, they're read in different ways. So it becomes these signifiers, which ties back to the nude figures I was doing, which would have like a ring or shoes, um, which help tell the story, or it's often used by people to tell the story of who they are or how they want to be seen. And these phones are all the things I've just mentioned, but they're also a, a recognition of, of the ambiguity of, of how we read each other and, and the desires that are contained within. It's um, something strangely radical about seeing a public sculptor or, or a sculptor in the public realm, did I say, <laughs> with a mobile phone. And that's, that's what's, you know, that's what's... Yeah, but people... How, how can be, behind we are. <laughs> people can be incensed by it. How, yeah. how dare this person be on a mobile phone? Because these large sculptures, these monuments, yeah, 
these, these are sculptures. They're not statues. These are these are these are sculptures about statues. Yeah. Yeah. How how dare it? How dare this artist represent someone on a phone when they should be, you know, shoulders back, chest out, head held high, looking down on us from a plinth. Yeah. You know. I'd love to. I'd love to talk a bit about that. What, what you, the thing you just said about their their sculptures, <laughs> yeah. not, you know, and your relate and that relationship to public sculpture, the sculptures in the, in public space, and you're yeah. Yeah. about to embark on your first commission for public realm. So the other one has been temporarily cited, um, and the the one for Hackney, I guess, is. Do they call these permanent these days? I don't know what's said about. <laughs> What's I mean, the, there's, yeah, I mean, the whole word permanence comes with baggage now, doesn't it? But yeah, I, mean, I guess I won't insist that they stay there. I won't say it's tradition, you know, <laughs> it must be here forever because it's tradition. Um, th they can be there as long as they serve, you know, uh, the purpose or as long as it's felt that they're serving a good purpose. You know, um, but can you talk a bit about, um, can you tell us a bit about um, your thoughts? So works in the pub in public realm and the difference between what you're doing um in terms of sculpting anonymous people well not anonymous yeah. people, imaginary individuals yeah. um, and how you're approaching the hackney commission where i know they want you to work with like working with the community and working with it's very yeah, well the, the so the hackney commission actually my proposal was to to work with the community mm. so uh, okay because it, I wanted to at least create an awareness of what was happening so that these sculptures wouldn't suddenly appear like mushrooms overnight yeah. in, in, you know, in someone's locality, in their, their home kind of you know, area, yeah. without them being aware of what was going on. Um, so for me, the process of meeting, you know, doing some 3D scanning, photographing and interviewing people is about absorbing their understandings into my practice or the process of making these works about creating yeah a sense of actual again ownership of the works once they're there because you know ideally people create their identities for these these pieces and um it's not me there dictating saying it means this and it means this and you must have respect for these things um so it's really about creating or providing an opportunity for visibility from people connected to windrush within hackney to feel seen, to feel valued, to, to have landmarks which include them, or of them, which they can relate to directly because I think for the most part, you know, I was gonna say we're not white man riding a horse. <laughs> Maybe you don't relate to uh, monuments, but you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's, there's a real power in feeling included. Uh, and there's a huge power of discovering that you can be included when you didn't even realize that you were, you know, or you suppress that so much so that you can function that you, you've sort of blocked out what you don't have. You've blocked out what you're not allowed to access or what you're not allowed to be considered part of. You know, it, it, I feel like I've come a long way in my practice at the beginning when I was only really asked, uh, why do you only got black people? And, you know, and the other question would be like, oh, but where are you really from, you know? This this kind of opportunity in Hackney to create the, the, the Hackney Windrush sculptures is really about planting, about saying literally in, in concrete, this is where we're, this, we're here, <laughs> from here, and, and to give visibility, to give everybody the opportunity to become familiar with these images and to start to conceive of them as part of the very fabric of the city, the very fabric of the borough, the very fabric of the UK, and not for those individuals in real life to have to explain where they're from and and to feel proud of the story of Windrush you know people asked to come over to help rebuild this country and who were treated in ways which were absolutely unfitting for for people who are going to help rebuild you know our nation and who are part of this nation you know and I don't know so there's something very for me, you know, potentially powerful about, yeah, having these visible uh, icons or, or locators of, of visibility and presence and, and value and um, uh, 
inclusion in in the UK, particularly given you know, the Windrush scandal. That's I'm saying that we, what that happened. It's still going on. Um, so been erased, that's been like bushed under the carpet. I mean, it's disappeared. Nice. The news cycles. So you know, this is the thing. You know, go on our mobile phones. We swipe. We, we scroll. But how much do we really engage? How much do we really um, absorb or act upon what what this thing is feeding us? And I think there is a real value in physical objects which um, do engage with those things and which allow us to to focus our inquisitiveness, you know, through them and, and amplify our inquisitiveness, that amplify our questions, amplify our um, desire to to change things or to, to get answers, to get knowledge or to hold people accountable. And um, so I think there's a real power in, in sculpture, generally speaking, which perhaps is a different type of power to other forms of artworks. Um, and because the, the public realm is so contentious, you know, people feel they own these bits. And so you get a, 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 an absolute instinct or, you know, a very truthful of that moment, a truthful opinion about things when you put them in the public realm. You know, you put something in the gallery, it's, it comes with all the, all the agreements, all the unspoken agreements about what you do in a gallery space. You put something in someone's walk to their work, you, you're in their space now and they're going to tell you what they think about that. And for me, that's a really important element to being able to explore, expose and, and, and work through a lot of the issues we have in society is to, to work in, in someone else's turf, you know, and, 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 and help and, and, and take that hit as an artist, maybe to your ego. Someone says, oh, we don't like it or what, what are you doing? But to, to encourage the conversation and to know that um, you know, my job is to, to, to work up until that point, you know, to do it as best I can, to really think everything through as much as I can, to make the best quality work I can and, and you know, stick to all my sort of principles and, and knowing that then it's, it's up to members of society to, to do with it what they will. You know. When are we going to see the, the Windrush Commission? It'll be in 22. So we are beginning um, the, the, the public uh, engagement process is beginning uh, in the, the second week of, of, of May, I believe. And so, you know, people can sign up um, if they go to the Hackney website and the Hackney Windrush. And uh, if you're, you know, if you've had a connection to Hackney and Windrush, fill in the form and um, hopefully, you know, I will, I will see you there and I'll get to sort of hear a bit about how you feel about your position or experience in the UK. Um, and then I'll be taking photographs and um, maybe a few sketches or something and some scanning. And then that will help me. That'll be the raw material that I will then put together with um, images from the Hackney, from the Windrush archive in Hackney to help me create, uh, it will be two figures which are gonna go into the square outside the town hall. And you know, at nine foot tall in bronze, I think uh, it, it should be quite a, a powerful statement of, of um, our intention about how we go forward. Yeah, I, I would not disagree with that. Does, does that bring us fully up to date with what you're, with your work at the moment then? Is that like the, the next thing? Um, that, that is one of the next things and it's a very important um, project for me. Um, yeah. And one that I'll be really zoning into. I've got quite a thing, a few things um, lined up. Um, I've got to do that really annoying thing where I say I can't talk about them. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, um, but yeah, there's a there's a lot happening, um, and hopefully I'll be able to share through Pangea Centre, you know, more projects that I'm involved with. Um, because yeah, I think yeah, I, I'm, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to do my bit, and you know. Get the work out there. Yeah, I should have mentioned that that Thomas, you're our first artist patron, and thank you for that. Um, I'm just gonna. Um, we've we've basically got most of the yeah. questions, but there's one final question that I'd love you to try and answer as succinctly as possible because we're really running out of time. But somebody has asked what your approach to patination and surface treatment is in relation to the representation of blackness. You can't answer it quickly, but can you answer it? Great question. Um, I wanted to use the black patina as a way to. Um, 
as a nod to the, the plastics of mobile phones. So to basically use this element of bronze, which has so many connotations about power and opulence or status and, or you know, officialdom and disguise it as something which perhaps looks a bit like it was, um, yeah, like a, a, a commodity, you know, a, an everyday material. Um, but then that also helped create these very strong silhouettes. And as you know, formally speaking about these works, you know, hopefully all the silhouettes from every angle are, are quite strongly registered in the, in the psyche. Um, so th there's other ways to explore patination, which I'm, uh, we'll be doing. Um, but yeah, so the black patina we see here, that's very much, it was a nod to kind of the, the, this idea of, you know, the hierarchy of materials for one of a better expression or a more fresh <laughs> expression. Um, but it was, and it's also just, you know, very traditional. It was a traditional kind of patina. Um, so it's, it's about acknowledging the history of art, about questioning the, the value of materials and about trying to create this cohesive um, work of art, which, which acknowledges its different strands. Thank you. That was a brilliantly succinct answer. Succinct. <laughs> thank you. Fantastic, thank you. I th we could genuinely talk to you all night, but <laughs> unfortunately we have to wrap this up. Um, but I would like to thank um, Elizabeth Nielsen from Prandier Sculptor Centre and Thomas J. Price for an absolutely brilliant discussion. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much for having me. I really, really enjoyed it. And hopefully as a patron, I can help and do some more. Excellent stuff. More talks. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> um, please um, join us for our next event in the Fabrication Series on May 12th, which is Heather, Heather Phillipson in Conversation, which will be absolutely wonderful. Um, you are most welcome to join us then. And for now, thank you so much to Lizzie and Thomas for a brilliant discussion. And thank you all for coming and for your fantastic questions. <laughs>